On Lectures in History, Duke University professor Laura Edwards teaches a class on public lands and the law in the early American Republic. She looks at competing visions for westward expansion among the founders, particularly Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson. She also talks about multiple federal laws aimed at controlling land distribution and discusses the role of the law in usurping Native American lands. This is about an hour and 15 minutes. So public lands and the legal order. And we're going to catch up just for a second to link this class to what we did last time. And last time we were talking about federalism, and particularly the balance of power between states and localities. Now, when people talk about federalism, they usually use the term to refer to the balance of power between the federal government and states. But last time we were talking about the debates between state and local level power. And those mirror debates at the federal level, and if anything, they were much more contentious because so much governing authority was actually located at the states and localities. And what we were talking about was a system of layered authority, where states had control over the rights of citizens and the public interest, but they gave local areas broad discretionary authority over a wide range of matters involving the public interest. So basically, the states then handed over all of this discretion over this broad area of the public interest to local areas. And so these jurisdictions then operated simultaneously with local areas doing their thing and states doing their thing. And this division also contained a conflict between two differing kinds of visions of law. So we had a universal view where states had monopoly over legal authority and they were the ones who defined the law. And then we had a particularistic view where states were actually made up of many localities. People thought, oh, it's not just a state, it's many localities and those localities all made up a state. And law came from multiple sources and outcomes then would be attentive to the particular circumstances of people and places. So that was last time, and this time we're going to move to Western lands and federal legal order. Now, we're going to continue this whole question of federalism here because Western lands were one of the areas where the federal government actually did exert a lot of power and authority. And Western lands illustrate here the power of law. Law is really crucial here. We think about private property as being something that's natural. But in fact, you can see the law at work in this whole issue of Western lands. So Western territory is made public actually through law. So first of all, you have to turn this land out there into the property of the public. And that's done through law. And then the law turns that land into private property. So once the law makes it public, it turns around and says, okay, now we're going to turn, into, we're going to turn this into private property. We're going to hand this over to individuals. And this process illustrates the legal power of the people, the people, that abstraction that we haven't really clearly defined yet. Um, And it defines this in the context of the federal government. So settlers who have legal standing within the new nation, they use their place as the people, as part of this new nation, to go settle lands and create a right to it. And Indians who do not have that standing in the people, they can't do that. So settlers, as the people have access to law, and this gives them a chance to create land as a private property, whereas Indians who are blocked from using the law are not able to do that, and they lose the land. And this is also about the purpose of government. So what are the goals and policies of the federal government? and whose interests should it actually represent. So all of this is at play here, and this is one place where the people are coming into contact with federal power. So the outline today, we're gonna talk about the revolution and the importance of land. Then we're gonna talk about land policies, And then we're going to talk about the conflicting interests of the people. And then we're going to talk about Native Americans who were excluded from the people and who actually didn't want to be part of the people. They had their own nations. They were not actually interested in being part of the United States. So first, the revolution and the importance of lands. So first of all, we have Hamilton's economic vision. So Hamilton, and there's Hamilton there, Hamilton equated commercial development and economic growth with national power. So England is his model here, and he's thinking commercial development, economic growth, the government needs to be actively involved in this in order to underscore and create and define the political power of the nation. So he wants an active national government that promoted the economy. He's linking those two things together. 
He wants in particular a high tariff to protect manufacturers. So if you have a high tariff, that means that you are increasing the competitiveness of manufacturers in your own country. So you're charging more for the goods that come in, right? Which then means that the goods that you're producing internally are more competitive. He wants to pay off the revolutionary debt to stabilize credit and improve credit ratings of the nation and the states. So he wants really strong credit for the country and for the states. And he also wants the establishment of a national bank to stabilize the currency. And in previous classes, we've talked about the problems of a scarce currency and an unstable currency, and also the diversity amongst all the currencies that the states are issuing. So that makes trade and commerce really difficult to do when you have multiple currencies all fluctuating in value, and it's difficult to tell the value of what you have in your hand that way. And he wants to have a stable currency and a single unified currency that would apply across the nation here. Hamilton is embedding liberalism into his economic vision. So Hamilton emphasized the government's role in protecting and expanding property ownership. And he really sees this as the primary goal of government. So government is there to protect property, to regularize its exchange, and to create circumstances that promote commerce. So individual interests and national interests are coinciding here in the protection of property. It's very John Locke, right? We're protecting property. That's the goal of government and the legal order. Hamilton's on board with all of this. He thinks that this is good for individuals to have a property regime that is secure, is in the best interest of individuals. The results are going to promote the strength of the nation because individuals will be able to engage in trade and work on their economic interests. And all of those individuals together in their economic interests will then underscore and re enforce the power of the nation. And so the nation then should promote these kinds of results. So we should have an active government that is involved in promoting all of this commercial activity. But actually, this focus on property owners betrays a narrow view of the people, right? Because those without property are not figuring in directly here in any way, shape, or form, really. In fact, Hamilton kind of, you know, is flippant on this. And he argues that, ah, you know, these policies are actually good for people without property, too, because it gives them something productive to do. Otherwise, they're just going to be lying around there, right? And so, no, we're going to give them something to do. And this is good for them, right? Excellent. So it's kind of an afterthought, though. His interests are really focused on property holders. Jefferson has a different view, and here's Jefferson. His is a Republican vision, and it's based in revolutionary ideology. And so he thinks for the republic to succeed in political terms, it needed an economically independent citizenry. So he too is linking the nation's political interests to its economic interests, but in a different way from Hamilton. So he's saying that only those who were economically independent could be good citizens. So only those who had sufficient land, tools, other forms of property to support themselves, only those people can actually be good citizens. You need that economic independence to be politically independent and participate in the polity. And Jefferson worried that Hamilton's brand of development would actually erase the middle here, all those independent farmers and artisans who he's depending on to provide sort of the economic bulwark of the nation. He thinks that Hamilton's plans are going to erase those people. They're going to eliminate the kinds of economic options that they need to sustain their independence. So he thinks that in the end, Hamilton's going to lead to two classes. You're going to have the people with property, and you're going to have those people without who need something to do. Um, And he's actually more interested in sustaining the middle here. And he thinks that if you go to those two classes, that basically you also will have a government that is only in the interest of the wealthy, that will be captured by the wealthy, and this will then ruin his Republican experiment. And he thinks it will result in unchecked power and ultimately the collapse of the republic, that we will end up, the United States will end up just like England. And this is not where he wants to go. Yet Jefferson's vision of the people here is also fairly limited, right? Because he wants those people who are economically independent, but that excludes actually the vast majority of the population who doesn't have property or who can't own property. Women who are wives can't own property. Propertyless people, they don't have property. Enslaved people don't have property. So you're talking about actually a vast majority of the population here who's excluded from his vision of the people, but it's still broader than Hamilton's. 
Now, Jefferson's policies, uh, his other policies, really reflect his political vision. So his economic policies are all about geographic expansion. He wants to add on more territory. The more territory you add on, the more land you have, the more land that is out there for people to farm, and then those farms will create the economic independence that he thinks is necessary for the nation. He also then is about incorporating these new territories into the republic. So actually, he's expansive. More states, more states, more areas, more land. He has incentives and support for settlement of those areas. And he's way into education. He thinks education is really crucial here. Because you don't just have to be economically independent. You also have to be an engaged, responsible citizen. And for that, you need a modicum of, of education here. So education is not for you know, economic opportunities. It's not job training in the way that we talk about it today. Education is education so that you can be an informed citizen in your country. So he's linking education to citizenry, and he is also for public support of education for that reason. It is good for the public interest to have an educated citizenry. And in fact, you can't have a republic without an educated citizenry. And so actually, this is a picture of University of Virginia, which Jefferson thinks as one of his prime accomplishments in life is founding this and supporting the University of Virginia. Now, liberalism and republicanism in Jefferson and Hamilton's vision coalesce actually in the post-revolutionary legal order. You get Locke through Hamilton, and we've talked a lot about Locke in past classes and his vision of liberalism. And so in this vision, land and other property needs to be used productively. Um, Although Jefferson is also arguing this, right? Land, property, you need to use this productively. Um, And that is part of the economic and political vision here. And government should be focused on the protection of property, which is also very much about Locke. You get republicanism more through Jefferson. And we've talked about republicanism as one of the founding ideologies of the revolution and the ways that that then filters through in shaping policy after the revolution. So through Jefferson, we get this idea of the political viability of the republic depends on citizens who are economically independent. That's crucial. It's called political economy for that reason. The politics and the economy go together here. And government then should ensure the economic basis for its political success. So here in republicanism, we have have an idea of government in the legal order, which is focused on providing the economic basis for basically the political health of the country. Economy and politics are merged here. And this results in a legal order that actually promotes certain kinds of economic activities. We tend to think of, you know, Western settlement as something that just happened. But it didn't just happen. This was created through policy, through a vision of a legal order, where law is vested in this process of creating public lands, then making those public lands central and open for settlement. This is crucial to what's happening as people are imagining the good of the country, what the goal of government is at this period. Now, the interests of certain members of the people then are being privileged, right? The people are those settlers, those farmers, those people who are going to go out and use those Western lands. Those are the people who are at the center of this legal order. But those lands then solidify also the relationship of the people to government. It's through those Western lands, through that participation in that process, that the people are also connected to government. So land is really, really crucial here. Now, there are contradictions and limits with this conception of independence, of this new legal order. Independence, in Jefferson's vision, it always needs help. There is no independent person in the early 19th century or the late 18th century. So independence, when they're talking about it, it doesn't mean alone. Like today, when we talk about independence, we tend to think, oh, I'm independent. I, I'm sort of by myself. People can live by themselves. You know, you live by yourself. You go to the grocery store. You buy your food. You come home. You microwave it, whatever. You can't do that in this period. You need help. You need a lot of people around you. And the people who talk about independence in this period, Period, they know that too. So when they talk about independence, they're assuming also the presence of dependence. So a household head then is the independent person who oversees and directs the labor of all the dependents in the household. And the dependents include his wife, the children, 
hired workers, and enslaved people. So independence requires a labor force. And wives are seen as part of that labor force. They're crucial in providing domestic labor. Um, you can't, like I said, go down to the convenience store and get something in a microwave. It. You have food that you need to process and prepare. Women are involved in that and are considered responsible for kitchen gardens, for also producing all of the clothing in the household, for a range of domestic work, which really is crucial work. You can't not do it, and you can't just sort of purchase that. Children are also considered laborers. This is why you have big families. You have big families because children are useful to work. You don't, you know, cherish them and send them to school and off to college. You put them in the fields. As soon as they're old enough, they start taking care of their younger brothers and sisters. So children are seen as the crucial workforce. You also have hired workers who are dependents because they're propertyless laborers, right? And enslaved people in those states that are still um, legitimizing having slavery. Now, dependents could never be independent. Their legal status meant that they could not own land or other kinds of property that could be the basis of independence. So dependents are kind of locked in this position, in this status. Wives, because of the property restrictions on them, can't purchase land. Enslaved people are property. They can't purchase land. Minor children, they also have legal restrictions that make that impossible. People without property usually are without property because they don't have the means to purchase land. And it's really difficult to acquire that by simply working for wages. So their legal status means that they basically cannot be independent. But there's also the assumption here that all these people who are in positions of dependency, um, that they're dependent by nature. And so, therefore, they're kind of constitutionally incapable of actually ever being independent to the point where it would be even dangerous to try this. So southern slaveholders in this period argue, for instance, that, well, we need to keep slavery because African Americans are, and this is their argument, naturally dependent by nature of race. And therefore, slavery is the means and the institutions of disciplining, containing, and protecting a naturally dependent population. So this presumption of dependence then leads to the assumption as well, and is built into it, sort of mutually reinforcing, that people are dependent because of who they are, and because of who they are is the reason why they're dependent. So this kind of locks them into this position. And yet, still, all these independent men are are themselves dependent on other people's labor. They're dependent on this whole range of dependence. And this is a central contradiction at the heart of Jefferson's vision, but also at the heart of a lot of the legal policies in the New Republic. There's a lot of talk of independence, but that talk presumes the presence of dependence. And those dependent people are still there supporting, actually, the independence of others. So now we're going to head into land policy, and we're going to make Western lands first public, and then we're going to turn them into private property magically through law. And law is really, really crucial here. So we've got the Northwest Territorial Ordinance, which I just have to say is really hard to say. Um, so I'm going to try to go slow. The Northwest Territorial Ordinance, 1787. It's one of the most important, yet really underrated pieces of, of, well, of, of legislation in the United States. We always look to the Constitution. And yet the Northwest Territorial Ordinance actually has some of the key assumptions that ground the legal order in the United States, particularly at the federal level. So this ordinance passed in 1787, which is the same year as the U.S. Constitution, it made lands the possession of the national government. So it makes all the Western territory the possession of the national government, of the federal government. And this is crucial because states were contesting over all of those lands. And so you have maps from the colonial period where, like North Carolina, Virginia, New York, they're projecting all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. And so they were claiming those lands. And what the ordinance does is say, no, 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 no. We're drawing boundaries on existing states. And that new territory doesn't belong to states. It belongs to the federal government. So it's that assertion of sovereignty and authority over that geographic space. But then it says, OK, we're going to sell those lands to the people. And they're going to become owners in fee simple. 
This is pretty amazing, actually, because in European nations, there is the presumption that the land belongs to the monarch. It belongs to the governing sovereign body, and people have it, but it still belongs to them. And there's a whole array of land tenures in Europe and in England where you have leaseholders, you have some people with freeholds like Fee Simple. Um, so there's an array of different kinds of land tenures, but there's always the presumption that the sovereign body still owns those lands. You own them, but your claim on them is not absolute. That kind of layered sovereignty and authority that we've talked about, another example of that. So this idea that these are going to be public lands, and we're going to sell them to people, and they own them in fee simple, which means they have control over them, and the government will cede control. This is something rather radical and rather new. And it's a Jeffersonian vision of actually handing over the means of supporting political independence through economic means, right? So they're also then tying the people to the new nation in this way. Everybody has a piece of this new nation, and they're all part of that sovereign body. So then the territories also become states. This is also really cool and very new. Remember, I mean, you know, North America, colonial appendage, right? This could have happened in the United States where you have the original 13 states and then they're like, ha ha, everybody else is going to be a colonial appendage. We're just going to go out there and, you know, mine the resources and we'll have people out there who are not politically involved in the nation. And that's just going to be the way it is. But no, here you have the orderly sort of process here by turning these territories into actual states. So they're also going to enter the states. These states are going to enter the United States on equal standing to existing states. And this actually is kind of a leap of faith here. And so imagine you have the 13 colonies turned into 13 states. They had this whole revolution. And now you're saying, okay, we're going to admit new states on equal basis. It's like, oh, really? Did they go through the revolution? I mean, what? I'm sorry. Why do they get to be equal to the rest of us? But this is this understanding then of the people moving west, right? And as they move west, where they are, that will be incorporated into the United States. So it is this notion of the people being at the center of the legal order here. Now, all those state governments, they're going to be similar to other states, so they have to follow certain rules. And citizens in them are going to be like citizens in other states. So just because you're moving around in the country doesn't mean you're going to go into some sort of lesser place, not some colonial appendage where you're not going to be able to do the things that you would in other states. And this is really, really different from the situation with other imperial powers. So these newly acquired lands, again, are not going to be colonial appendages. The land in these other places still belong to the monarch, even if it was owned by individuals, and that is not the case here. So it's made public and then turned into private property. And again, this happens because of this policy and law. This is not something that is just, oh, of course, that's the way we're going to do it. This is a conscious decision. And you see here the Northwest Territory, right? So Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin. Um, so this is what we're talking about. So independence here. Other elements of Northwest Ordinance underscored Jefferson's vision of independence. So as part of the Northwest Territorial Ordinance, you have partable inheritance. So in fact, you can divide up your property and will it to a number of people. None of this property is going to be held in a way that provides that it has to be transmitted to the eldest son, for instance. So you're not going to have primogenitor. Um, they're not going to entail it, in, which means that you can only keep it within the family. This is going to be property that you can divide up and you can sell. Um, so you're going to be able to alienate this property of your own free will and decide what you're going to do with it without a lot of restrictions on it. It sets aside land for public schools. So within each little district territory that they set out here, there's a certain amount of land that's set up for a public school. Um, Again, underscoring Jefferson's vision about the importance of education and an educated citizenry and public support for that as well. It bans slavery, and this is on the basis that small farmers would not be able to compete with slave labor. So again, Jefferson's vision here is that we need small farmers here, a lot of independent people, not a lot of dependent people. And if small farmers have to compete with these large plantations with slaves and slave people, that this is really something that they're not going to be able to do. And you'll end up basically consolidating all this property in the hands of a few. And that's not what he's going for. 
And it also erases Indian land claims, um, which opened up more land and also eliminating overlapping claims to sovereignty in any given area. So where European powers, as we talked about in previous classes, would claim land, but then allow, also acknowledge Indians' claims to sovereignty over that land as well, this is not what's going to be happening anymore. This is going to, the Northwest Territorial Ordinance, it challenges that older presumption about land layered sovereignty, layered claims to land, um, and this is going to promote promote conflicts. And you saw that in some of the documents that that were assigned today. And notice, too, that these are the kinds of positive statements about this is what the government does that was lacking from the U.S. Constitution and that you noticed and talked about in your blogs for that class. Like, oh, U.S. Constitution is a pretty thin document there. Um, it doesn't have positive statements about what government will do. It's mostly about the organization of government and what government won't do. And here you have positive statements about what it will do, actually. So the legacy here, as Jefferson cars up the Midwest into these nicely arrayed little uh, blocks that they're going to now sell off to all of the nice little small independent farmers in the United States. You see this when you fly over the Midwest. I'm always like fascinated by this. I'm looking out the airplane window going, oh my gosh. But you know, they survey all this land. You want to survey it and then you're going to open it up to settlement. And what you have here, and this is winter in Illinois, is well, the artifact of that, right? It's still actually written onto our landscape. We can see Jefferson's vision and the ter- Northwest Territorial Ordinance in the land that we still live on. So all of those surveyed little squares are exactly what was done after the Northwest Territorial Ordinance. And those little plots of land are exactly what was sold then. And we still have that surveyed sort of map onto the territory there. So, you know, you fly over and it's like, oh, there's Jefferson. When I look down and look at the Midwest, I just think that's so cool. Um, but th- there's actually physical representation of this is kind of amazing that it has lasted that long. And then Jefferson, after the ordinance, he gets, he does more land. So he has the Louisiana Purchase. And this is really one of, this is 1806. And one of Jefferson's more significant and enduring achievements. So we have, you know, everybody talks, oh, we have the Louisiana Purchase. Yeah. And you kind of toss it off. And yet, This is amazing. It more than doubles the size of the new nation. And when you think about the implications of that, it's pretty astounding. Actually, to double the size of a country and then imagine, like, how are you going to incorporate all those people in, right? All that territory. This seems like a pretty big challenge. Um, And giving, like, current debates over immigration, both here and in Europe, um, you know, people now are thinking through the process of that and imagining that to be a real difficulty. And here's Jefferson adding on double, more than doubling the size of the United States with the expectation that that will fill up with new people, new people from within the United States, but also new people coming to the United States. It's pretty amazing. And it is this optimistic vision of the country, but one based on that faith in that economic independence being necessary for the political future of the country. So he's willing to gamble on that kind of expansion because he thinks that expansion is really necessary for the political health, for the basic legal order of this country. So it's not an accident that he of all presidents did this. In fact, it was really controversial at the time. It's like, I believe this is overstepping presidential authority to be doing all of this. And Jefferson's like, yeah, whatever. And he goes ahead and does this anyway because he thinks this is so absolutely crucial given the way he's understanding both politics, law, and the economy here. So he's really hoping he's going to secure the nation's political future this way. And this is his legacy to all of us. Um, And then subsequent law established settlement of this land on similar terms is set out in the Northwest Territorial Ordinance, although the issue of slavery remains unresolved. So actually, all of this Louisiana purchase, I mean, if you continue to fly over the Midwest, you still see all of the blocks of land like in the Northwest Territorial Ordinance. But the Louisiana purchase also moves south, and it doesn't say anything about the status of slavery. So this will become an issue, and we'll talk about this in future classes, because what happens with the status of slavery, 
as those territories become states, becomes very crucial in this whole question about federalism, but also the balance of power between the federal government and states over who's going to actually control the status of citizens. What's interesting here as a sideline about the Northwest Territorial Ordinance is that it does step in and make a statement about the status of citizens, right? It eliminates slavery from that area. Um, and that is an early sort of foray of the federal government into that area, but one that it backs off from after that. And that, too, is contested, actually. People who had already moved into the territory had slaves. Um, so there are people in Illinois and Indiana and Wisconsin, Ohio. This becomes very contentious, and there's lots of resistance at the state and local level for the abolition of slavery that was done through the ordinance. Yes, Ethan. Uh, so once these um, territories became states, uh, even though none of, none of them legalized slavery, could they have hypothetically done that? Well, there were actual conventions in Illinois where they tried to do that, in Indiana where they tried to do that, um, so, but they didn't fly. But they, what they do is they do an end run around some of the pre- restrictions on slavery, so they have apprenticeships that last for a very long time. Um, they also grandfather in some enslaved people, and you know there are people who are sort of existing as virtual slaves who are held for life. And as long as they're held, unless they challenge that legally, they're still held. And so there's all these ways that people in the territories get around this question of slavery. Illinois is also an interesting example because it's really near Missouri. And people go back and forth between Missouri and Illinois. Um, And so, yes, there actually is still slavery in these places. And there's also people who are enslaved for life. Um, But technically, no, you don't have slavery. But it is a debate, and people are concerned and upset in the territories that they were not able to determine that. So, uh, yes, it's a contentious issue. Okay, now we're going to go on to the conflicting aims of the people here. And the people are notoriously, well, conflicted. Um, there is no the people. And as you'll find out increasingly over time in this course, the more people that you put into the category of the people, the more conflicts you're going to have, right? It's actually easy to have a very harmonious the people if you restrict it to only a few folks who have the same interests. Once you start adding on, then you get more conflicts. So we've turned this land into public property with the Northwest Territorial Ordinance, um, and we've called it public land for the benefit of the people But who are these people who are going to be benefiting from this public land? So immediately, the distribution of public land gets really, 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 really complicated because there's so many different people who count themselves as part of the public. So some people, some members, some people who count themselves members of the people want the land to go to those who lived on it and improved it. So they want to be able to settle before establishing a claim, and then they want to be able to purchase those claims in small parcels. Now, this is a time-honored way of actually making legal land claims, time-honored in the Anglo-American tradition. You have owned a piece of property, you improve it, you work it, and through the ways that you've improved the land, this is the basis for a legal claim, right? Think lock, right? You applied your labor to the land, and because you've improved it and added value to it, this translates into a legal claim that the courts recognize oftentimes, um, as actual, you know, a way to establish legal title and legal ownership to that. So all these settlers who've been moving across the proclamation line, um, which was the line that the British drew on the Appalachian Mountains before the American Revolution, and all the American colonists are ignoring that and moving west, and then all the American colonists are ignoring their own government, and they continue to move west, what they're doing is, okay, fine, I can make legal claim to this land through settlement itself. And then when I'm there, the government should recognize my claim. So you still have all these people trundling across with their wagons and whatnot, making legal claims to these lands, or at least they think they ought to be able to. But you've got manufacturing interests in the East who are not eager to make land too cheap for fear of losing their labor force. So you have these people who are Hamiltonian, right? They want to build up manufacturers in the United States, and they're all along the East Coast. They got their little factories. They got their little businesses. What do they want? They want cheap labor. And if all their labor goes West, well, then the price of labor rises. They don't like this idea. In fact, they're very doubtful about this whole Jeffersonian thing anyway. 
Now, some people don't want to give away valuable land to a bunch of people who they see as hicks, yokels, ne'er-do-wells, and freeloaders. Those are all the settlers who want to go settle and then claim the land. So these people who are arguing against that call those people squatters. And there's this, there's this, all this iconography of these kind of slat jawed yokels sitting in, you know, shacks out in the middle of nowhere, smoking corn cob pipes and drooling on themselves that is put out by people who are saying, no, actually we can't just give the land away to these people. We're giving away the treasure of the United States, public property to these folks. This is, this, we ought not to be doing this at all. We need to actually charge more money for this and come up with a better plan about how we're going to actually, you know, capitalize on this incredible public treasure that we have. And others who plan to stay where they are, they don't want the prices so low that the federal government doesn't make any money on the deal. It's like, okay, I'm out in the East. I'm never going to benefit from that Western land. The only way I benefit is if we charge enough money for it that it goes into the public treasury, and then we can use that money for other things. So we should charge more money, not make this land cheap. And we certainly shouldn't give it away. And then commercial interests and land speculators who want in the West, who are want sort of easy access and purchase policies, they want that so they can seize large plots of land, um, and then they want to be able to you know divide that up and resell it at a profit. So they're like, no, let's open this up immediately. Let's make these plots large and cheap, and I can go in there because I have money, and I will buy that up, and then I'll resell it in smaller allotments to other people. So yeah, let's go in there and open this up right away, and let's make this cheap. And then there are also conflicts between the North and the South as slaveholders begin to fear that these spread of independent farmers in the West, hmm, maybe that's not a good idea because we start adding more and more states to the Union that don't have slavery and are composed of all of these little ornery small farmers. I don't think that's a really good idea. So they're concerned about that balance of power between slave states and free states. And that starts now, but it will become more and more of a problem over time. So we start getting sectionalism involved in all of this Western settlement as well. So then... I'm going to give you a series of statutes, land policies here, that try to sort through all these conflicts. Now, I used to assign these as readings, but um, it's kind of self-explanatory what they mean. And so now I'm giving them to you in the context of the lecture itself. So the first thing is a statute on the sale of public lands from 1829. And this statute assumes that the lands are public in the sense that they belong to the federal government. So clear here, public lands belong to the federal government. And although the goal here is to disperse these lands to individual members in this statute, um, in individual members of the public, the federal government decides when the land will be put up for sale. So we're establishing this orderly transmission of public lands to private individuals. And if you want it, you're going to have to follow this procedure and process, right? So the government has authority over this. It's going to set the terms for sale. You can't just move out there. And this is part of that battle between the folks who just want to move out and then have the government legitimize claims and the government. It's like, no, 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 no. It's public land. We get to decide. You have to follow our dictates. And it also here in this statute, it it assumes that that it gets something. The federal government gets something out of the sale of these public lands. So it's not just going to distribute them. There is going to be some compensation here so that the rest of the public who is not living on those lands will also benefit. So this act allows a purchase for full sections, half sections of lands, quarter sections, and even half quarter sections, um, which means that you have these big sections and you can divide them up into smaller sections, which opens them up to smaller farmers, right? So it is making this more accessible to more people. So it's not doing the speculator thing. Um, It's going to actually allow, at least hopefully, smaller farmers to get some access to these lands. It also prohibits credit for the purchase of any public lands, which is also a provision that's meant to cut down on speculation. So speculators have access to credit. You know, they're going to float credit, get access to all this money, purchase huge swaths of lands, and then turn around and sell it and make a profit. And it's say, no, 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 cash on the barrel head here. No credit. We don't take Visa or MasterCard. Um, so no, we're not going to do that. You have to actually come up with the money here. 
course, there is no Visa and MasterCard at this time, but you take my meaning. Um, and then it also sets the minimum price at $1.25 an acre, which is actually pretty high. So it's cutting the lands up into smaller plots, but then it sets it at $1.25 an acre, which is actually pretty high. That's a lot of money in 1827. So in fact, it's going to be very difficult for a lot of smaller farmers to go out and purchase this. And if you're poor, if you have no property at all, this is really out of the question then. And there's no limit on the amount of land that an individual could purchase. So you see there that this is, you know, on the one hand, we're limiting speculation, but on the other hand, we're allowing speculation. Like so many pieces of legislation, this is about compromise, right? You can see all of the elements of this debate and conflict, and they're trying to resolve that within the context of statutes like this. But in fact, you still see all the competing parties and interests at play here. So the next act is, and the title of this should alert you to what it's about, an act for the relief of the purchasers of public lands and for the suppression of fraudulent practices, right? So this is 1829. Uh, We've just laid out for the orderly transmission of these lands, right? 1830, we already have an act to prevent fraud. Um, So some members of the public are definitely seeing public land quite differently. And the federal government is passing all of these statutes. And then people are still obviously doing what they think they're going to be doing, um, quite apart from the federal government. So this question about sovereignty and federal sovereignty at play here, right? In last lecture, I was talking about the ways that the federal government was not nearly kind of the centralized authority that people imagine it to be. It's important. It has authority. But it's new, and not everybody is on board with what its scope should be and what its scope is and what its authority should be. And here is a good case in point. The federal government's passing legislation, and all these people are basically ignoring it. So many people form organizations that are designed to keep land prices down. Um, So they organize. They often do this through incorporation. So they go incorporate themselves, which is a legal act, to form a corporation so that they can bid to keep land prices down. So they'll all move out to a place, and then when they show up for the auction, none of them bid. And oh gosh, the land prices go down. They, they don't rise. They're not bidding it up. So they're collaborating legally in legal forms in order to actually do something that is in opposition to federal law, right? Um, And they believe that as members of the public, they had a right to this land, and they don't really think of it as a public resource that should benefit the nation. And if you think about people who are imagining themselves as part of the people and is constituting the public, if you imagine yourself in that way, then public land is yours because you're a member of the public. See, right? Um, So what they're doing, they imagine to be perfectly legitimate. And they're thinking that the government is actually overstepping its boundaries by doing things like charging money for this land. I mean, why would they charge the public for land when they're the public, right? Um, So this idea of the people in the public, it gets very blurry and causes a lot of conflict here. And so this statute is then aimed at stopping this collusion by groups of people who are trying to keep the prices down by both rigging bids and doing other things. Um, so it's trying to cut down on all of this. Um, but as you will see from the next statute, which is a preemption statute from 1830, they're not particularly successful here. So Congress issues all of this, no fraud Um, But people obviously keep moving out onto public lands. And this preemption statute is an example of many, many, many preemption statutes that were passed by Congress that acknowledge prior claims to land made through settlement. And this statute then gives insight into this whole area of conflict, whole other area of conflict over the meaning of public lands. So for These folks, the term does not mean, public lands, does not mean that they're in possession of the federal government. It actually means that it's in the possession of the public, right? So directly, rather than the government representing the public, it is the actual public. Um, It's an interesting conflict here, and it's actually one that we still have out with the use of Western lands in particular. 
So many settlers then are entering these territories before the lands are open for settlement and sale. The fraudulent issue is part of that. They'll form a corporation, then they go out and settle lands before they're open for sale with the idea there that they're going to get the best lands before they're actually open. Um, so they're there before the federal government opens them up. So they will squat on this piece of land and start working it on the presumption that basically possession is nine-tenths of the law. And squatters come from that notion that you squat on this land. Um, and it's also seen as a derogatory term at this time, squatters, squatting. That's not, that, that's not something you say to somebody if you want to be respectful. Now, what's interesting here is the U.S. Congress often accommodates these people with these preemption statutes, like the one here that's legitimating settlers' claims to the land. Um, to me, this is fascinating. It's like, okay, these settlers go out there. They've been causing problems here since before the revolution, right? I mean, they were a Thornton Britain side. They exacerbated all the problems of the Seven Years' War. Um, they exacerbated problems during the American Revolution. And now they're going out there again in violation of their own government's legal policies. And then they have the gall to come back and petition Congress and say, oh, by the way, can you pass a law that acknowledges our claim to these lands? And then Congress does, right? <laughs> it's like, wow, that's really interesting. Instead of saying, get off, we've sold them to somebody else. Like, oh, okay, I guess we'll do that. Um, and this, I think, says a lot about the power of those people, right? Um, Congress, in fact, does not really want to say no because saying no to these people is not something they want to do. That's pretty dangerous to tell members of the people who are using acknowledged customary legal claims of claiming land that they can't do that. So Congress doesn't do that. And they then pass these statutes that say, sure, you can have the land. So it deals with these preemptions from actually 1830s, but it, it stretches back before um, in parts of you know, the old Southwest too. There's all these people who are actually in these areas already, not even just settlers who moved into them. And the U.S. government is always then sort of dealing with these claims to land by people who are already there. So this idea, too, that somehow this land is blank and public, this is also a creation of policy, right? It's, it's a fiction that the federal government has lobbed out there, a legal fiction, so it can claim that land and then distribute it. But in fact, on the ground, the reality is much more messy here. There are people who are already there. There are European people who are already there from French, Spanish rule, uh, British people who are there. There are also Native Americans who are there, and we'll get to that in a second. But nonetheless, Congress is still acknowledging these preemption statutes of settlers who have, in violation of law, gone out there. And they actually make preemption a general right in 1841, which is, they say, okay, we're not dealing with this anymore. We're just going to make a general right. Um, and basically, the federal government is like, okay, we're, we're, we're done trying to keep these settlers in check. Suggests, though, the power of the people here. And you had Mr. Jason Lothrop, who is a case in point. Now, there is Jason Lothrop there, looking very distinguished in that 19th century scary kind of way, you know. Um, they always have these pictures of 19th century people, and it's hard to imagine they ever smiled or laughed, I think. I mean, that's part of how they had to pose for their portraits, but somehow they come across always looking extraordinarily stern and earnest, and he's really filling the bill there. And he, there's the Baptist church that he preached at. So he is an upstanding member of Kenosha, Wisconsin. And I know he's an upstanding member because there are pictures that you can find in the Wisconsin archives that have been digitized. And they have all sorts of stuff with Jason Lothrop all over them. So, um, yes, distinguished member of Kenosha. Um, but he was an illegal squatter. He's basically an outlaw. But this is what an outlaw looks like, right, in the 19th century United States. And so he and his congregation settled in Wisconsin territory before it was officially open for them to do so. Um, and Max, you were talking about this in your blog, where basically you notice that what Lothrop is doing is he's incorporating, he and his crew have incorporated and to go out, which is a legal body, they incorporate themselves as a legal body, then they go out with express purpose of 
undermining and not abiding by federal policy. And they go out and they settle in Kenosha, Wisconsin, essentially. Um, and then they turn around and insist that the land that they had illegally seized was actually theirs. And they become basically the upstanding citizens of Wisconsin as a result. So the way they're portrayed as the squatters with the people who are in their little hut with their corncob pipe who are squatting, this is actually what a squatter looks like. And you get a sense then of why Congress is so worried about kind of crossing these folks, right? These are the upstanding people from older states that then go out to newer settled territories and they're demanding that their land claims be recognized. And well, as part of the people, it gets really hard to tell them no. And what's interesting here aside from the actual portraits, is that they're very legalistic in their illegality. So Lothrop and his crew are suggesting that they have, well, they have a deeply held alternative view of the public lands, but it's so firmly entrenched in their mind that what they're doing is legitimate, that it doesn't occur to them that what they're doing is actually illegal, right? They're just like, okay, this is, of course, we're going to do this, and of course people will recognize it. It's not illegal. They're turning their vision into something legal, and they're able to do that because of their position in the people. So they're forming that joint stock company to finance settlement. It's a legal document, a legal body. Then that fell apart, but the group went out anyway and made no secret that they're not following the settlement terms laid out by the federal government. They insisted on their property rights, despite all of that. Um, And they form a claimants union, which is organized around actually then, you know, promoting their rights with Congress and making sure that their rights are recognized. So they're creating rights here. And those rights have legal basis, but they're creating rights that they hope will be recognized by the federal government. And that story is typical. You see it over and over and over and over and over. So Congress is constantly dealing with these kinds of claims. And it's shaping the law of public lands. And you saw that in the statutes. You saw the first thing in 1829, the federal government's like, here's what we're doing, folks. You got it? And then you see in 1830, it's like, no, 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 no. I don't think you understood. This stuff is fraudulent. Let's spell that fraudulent. And no, you ought not to be doing that. Please don't do that. Then 1830, okay, okay, we'll recognize your claims. Okay, okay. And then they keep doing that, right? This is an ongoing debate where these people's claims are embedded into federal policy here. Um, So they are driving this. And this is one of these spaces where people actually have contact with the federal government. In the last class, I was saying, oh, yeah, not so much. You get the post office, you get veterans' um, pensions, Western lands is the other place where people have contact with the federal government and in territories. So this is one place where the people are actually shaping federal policy in a really clear, substantive way. But that's very different from Native Americans here. So Native Americans end up here as nations ultimately without land, But think about what I just said about Jefferson's vision, right? Jefferson is about dividing up the land, giving it to individual people who then are part of that sovereign body, right? The land is actually crucial to a nation. It's hard to have a nation without some grounding in a place. And essentially, through law in this period, Indian nations are created as something entirely different, as entities, national entities, without any land, which makes it very difficult for them to have any kind of grounding and basis. So land and the legal order, crucial here. The Northwest Territorial Ordinance only applied to that territory, but its basic principles guided land policies elsewhere. So this nation whose political future is now, it's based on expansion. More land is necessary to establish independence as the population grows. The government's goal is to distribute land to its people and incorporate new areas into the nation. We've turned that into part of the purpose of government. I just want to emphasize that here because I think we take that for granted. Of course, that would be the way it was, but that wasn't just natural. That was an actual creation of law, a purposeful, deliberative decision that that's what government would do and that's what the legal order would be centered around. 
And then the new nation is based on this equation that emphasizes private ownership of all land within its borders, right? So we have a nation then that it has a geographic border, but that geographic border within there are all of these private plots of land that are owned by individuals who own them absolutely. Um, there are legal restrictions on land. We'll get into that actually some next time. But it is a very distinctive notion of the economic grounding of a nation based in a certain vision of private property. That, though, undermines established ways of dealing with Indians, because we've just had this border of the United States. That was that. Um, it's not a very good border, but we have this border of the United States, right? And then we have drawn it up into land parcels that are owned by private individuals. Whereas before, you would have Great Britain claiming territory, but then allowing sovereignty of Indian nations within it, right? So in that sense, we're moving away from an established way of handling layered sovereignty and claims to land, and we're turning it into something more absolute where there's no space for Native Americans except as owners of private property. And that's not the way they handle land. And they don't want parcels of private property. They want land on which to situate their nations, right? I mean, what you, they, well, it's, they're like France. We have France without an actual place. That doesn't make any sense. And so that's not what Native Americans are going for here, is they don't want to be private property owners within the United States. They want land for their own nations. So an issue here, then, is the legal erasure of land claims. This is a really difficult legal issue. If you start erasing some people's land claims and some people's claims to private property... Turns out you might be able to do that to other people too. The law here, it's really hard with property claims in law for it not to start sliding over into other people, right? So this is a really difficult proposition to figure out how you extinguish some people's claims to property without having that legal precedent affect other property owners. So if the United States government can take away property from Native Americans, it might also then use those principles to do the same thing to actual people, other people, other Americans, right? So this is very difficult. And again, I want to sort of stop here and talk about, I mean, let that power of law sink in. Because it's not like you can walk into a court and say, oh, we're just going to take property away from these people over here because we don't like them because they're Indians. Um, and then you can't do that because the principle is about the seizure of property, not necessarily the status of the people. So the principle of the seizure of property could then spill over onto other folks, right? So this idea that we talked about last time about a universal understanding of law with principles that apply to everyone, right? This is the way these political leaders and legal leaders are seeing this. And if you buy into that, then it makes the seizure of lands of particular people a dodgy proposition, something that could be very, very dangerous. So it takes a while to kind of work through this. And we start working through this with the legal erasure of land claims and the Northwest Territorial Ordinance. And that actually erases land claims by turning the land into the property of the federal government and giving the federal government jurisdiction over all matters relating to the Indians. And so I'm going to read here from Article 7. Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. The utmost good faith shall always be observed towards the Indians. Their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent. And in their property rights and liberty, they shall, be, they shall never be invaded or disturbed unless in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress. We always have that exception, those just and lawful wars. But laws founded in justice and humanity shall from time to time be made for preventing wrongs done to them and for preserving peace and friendship with them. Okay, when you read this, at first glance, it seems like, oh, this is acknowledging Native Americans' claims to land, right? And it's also saying, oh, no, you need to actually be nice to these folks. But no, there's an underlying thing here. It's like, no, the lands belong to the federal government. The federal government, if you remember the Constitution, now deals with Native Americans. And so Native Americans are under the jurisdiction of the federal government, and the federal government will be the ones to protect them. Now, this should give people pause a little bit, especially Native Americans. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why uh, the federal government? Why are we going to imagine that's going to actually be very protective, right? And here the language seems good. 
Um, but on the other hand, that means following through here. So if the federal government protects them, then the lands will be you know, acknowledged. But this could also go the other direction because the federal government actually is laying claims to these lands. Now, Native Americans, remember, were left out, and I don't think I said this before, left out of the Treaty of Paris, which ceded the lands in the Northwest Territory to the United States after the American Revolution. So we had this whole treaty. And guess what? The people who actually owned the land to them, Native Americans, they weren't there. So in a very classic sort of European imperial way, they ceded control of those lands to the United States, right? So it's claims to those lands where Native Americans actually live with that layered sovereignty. Native Americans were there, Europeans claimed them, fine. They handed them over to the United States. They didn't tell Native Americans. And now the United States has a whole different approach to the land, one that does not allow for that kind of layered sovereignty of claims, but then also recognition of other claims at the same time. And Indians here also cannot, under the territorial ordinance, dispose of their lands directly. They have to go through the federal government. So the federal government is now going to be the arbiter, the the big entity that you have to go through to deal with Native Americans, but also increasingly the entity that is going to be supervising Native Americans. So and then we get into the power of law to frame these issues, and you get a lot of text here. Johnson v. McIntosh is one of the key decisions. This is 1823. And it affirms the principle of Indian nationhood. So negotiations with Indians are within the domain of federal policy. We've established that constitution, followed through with that with the Northwest Territorial Ordinance. Um, So that principle of nationhood and negotiations with the federal government, that's key because basically the constitution... Johnson v. McIntosh, Northwest Territorial Ordinance, is treating Indian nations like other nations, right? So just as the federal government deals with France, so they deal with the Cherokee Nation. Um, It's not for states to treat with those nations. That's what the federal government does. But Indians may be nations, but according to Johnson v. McIntosh, they have no land. So how do you get around the fact that territory ceded was also claimed by Indians, essentially? So ceded in the Treaty of Paris, claimed by Indians. This is how you do it. Indian claims don't matter because they had already been conquered by European powers who obtained rightful claims to the land. So this is also, at the beginning of the class, remember I said, law often rewrites history, but it always uses history as legitimization and precedent, right? So I've been saying, and we've been talking about how European powers claim land, but Indian nations also claim land, and those coexisted. Um, And European powers claimed knowing that Indians also had claims, and those were both there. Um, That, of course, was contested and source of conflict as to the extent of those claims and where they abutted and overlapped. And oftentimes, you know, European powers are trying to extinguish Indian claims to land. But there was that sort of vision, that possibility here. And now Johnson v. McIntosh is rewriting that saying, no, European powers came over and conquered, and they conquered successfully. So by the time the United States was established, those claims of Indians were already gone. Those were already extinguished. And moreover, it's not the United States' fault. It's the Europeans' fault. Um, so, yes, you can go back to the Declaration of Independence and, you know, those Europeans, bad folks. And amongst the other things that they did were conquer and extinguish Indian claims to land, and therefore the United States got clean title to them, essentially, in the Treaty of Paris. And also, generally, um, outside the Northwest Territory as well, all Indian claims were extinguished by European imperial powers way before the American Revolution. So therefore, Indians are nations, but they're inferior to other nations. They're different kinds of nations here. And this case also then casts the interests of Indians and the New Republic as opposite, in perpetual conflict. So Indians are sort of lesser nations, which are unfortunately lodged in the middle of the United States. And this is going to be a conflict that you're going to have to Resolve. You have to somehow make Indians go away because their presence in their current state is really not tenable. 
Indians have to leave the land altogether because they cannot coexist with whites and could not live in the republic. Now, this may sound simply about race, and it is about race to a certain extent, but think back to that Jeffersonian vision, right? This is also about a vision of the legal order. If you have a country based on this notion of plots of land that are private property, it is harder than to have a vision of Indian nations within that United States, right? So it is the logic of the legal order that's being set up that also makes Indian presence within the United States problematic in legal terms. Not just a matter of race, but also a matter of the kinds of property regime that is at the root of the United States legal order. So not only do ideals of republicanism, natural rights, and self-rule not extend to Indians, but Indians are dangerous to this whole project of the United States. Their presence as a different kind of civilization rooted within the United States is problematic, and that has to be dealt with. So then Indian nations here are also under the protection of the federal government. So we're moving Indian nations lesser, inferior, we're moving them more into the protection of the federal government rather than sort of on equal terms with the federal government. So they're not like France. They're lesser than France. They're still an independent nation, but not quite the same thing here. And so that protection can be less than comforting, actually, um, given the fact that those two cultures have just been cast as in some sort of dire opposing battle to the death, right? So the Indian nations are reading this going, okay, so our interests are diametrically opposed to your interests, but now we're under your protection? Jeez, that doesn't sound like a good plan to us. So here we're seeing some of the conflicts being dealt with, the legal issues about actual claiming title, why the United States has title, why Indians don't, but then also separating out Indian nationhood from those claims to the land. And I'm going to leave, I have a big quote to one side of this, I'm going to leave you to read that, um, because it is this justification of European conquering of Indian lands, and then the United States also being cast as somewhat the innocent in this. The poor United States was left with this situation that was actually created by Europeans. So you would often find this, this sort of gesture in, in the legal handling of Indian land claims, where judges would throw up their hands saying, oh... If only the situation were not this, and yet, actually, legally, they're the ones who are creating the situation, but putting it off onto the past as the explanation for what's going on. So then we get the Cherokee Nation, 1831, and exclusion. So we set up Indian nations, United States, as being in conflict, in opposition. These two places cannot, these two people cannot inhabit the same place. Um, and this then sort of goes, not inevitably, but ends up with the idea of exclusion. So Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, this is a case um, involving suing over the seizure of Indian land and then their removal. Um, so they've been the long, you know, history here. The Cherokee Nation is now being excluded from their lands and removed to Oklahoma. And they're suing. And the United States Supreme Court refuses to hear the case. Because Indians, they argue, are independent nations that have no legal standing in the United States. So this is exclusion from the people, right? Indian nations as nations are separate. They're not part of the people. And so now the Indian nations are created, they're placed under the protection of the United States, but in fact, they can't sue the United States because they're not members of the people. So this creates kind of a conundrum from which there's little way out, at least legally. The lands are being separated from them legally in law, right? And yet they cannot access the law that is doing this because they're not part of the people. Think about the difference with Jason Lothrop here, right? Jason Lothrop can go out there and settle land and put his you know, little hut and house down and his Baptist church down, and he gets legal claim to them. But Native Americans are classified legally as other nations, and as members of other nations, they cannot sue because they're not members of the people. So they are under the control of the federal government in this, as this, this goes further than Johnson v. McIntosh, calls them domestic dependent nations. And think about that in relationship to the whole vision of Jefferson, right? Jefferson is about independent farmers. Everybody else is dependent, and as dependents, they don't have sort of direct access to the government, right? Um, and 
Native Americans are classified as domestic dependent nations in a de- relationship of dependency to the federal government in a way that's analogous legally to dependencies of wives, of children, of enslaved people, of working people to their household heads. So we have this sort of legal creation here of these nations that are inferior nations without land, but then subordinated to the federal government, which is actually not the relationship of nations to each other. This is is not how France or Britain relates to the United States. And imagine if, you know, the French envoy went off and told the government, ah, guess what? We've decided to turn you into a domestic dependent nation. Um, I don't think France would be very excited about that, right? But legally, Indian nations are cast differently here. Not quite nations. They're also not members of the people. And you get a sense of the growing frustration from the documents that you were signed today with all of the Indians saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, these are our, these are, this is our land. What's happening here? Um, and what had seemed so obvious to them in a legal order where they could claim lands in the colonial era. And now that is going away in this new legal order, which is based around an entirely different notion of public lands and property. Their frustration is palpable and they really have no recourse in law. And that's what they need recourse in because this is all happening in a legal arena. So here we also have changes on the horizon. And we'll end here with contradictions in Jeffersonian land policies. So we have this legal order based on private property, the distribution of land, the expansion so that we can continue to distribute land with the idea that this is what is good for the legal order of the country. And we have all sorts of policies framed around that, which do elevate certain interests, the interests of farmers, over other interests. Manufacturers are still there saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm not sure about this whole opening up of Western lands. Excuse me, this is not what we have in mind. So we're elevating farmers. They're still members of the people within the United States that, you know, they're, they're, they're not at the center of things here, although this legal order is not exactly working against their interests either. Um, so we have contradictions here coming on. Jefferson's egalitarian vision assumes inequality for others, right? The language, the ideals, some of the promises of the revolution suggest otherwise. It suggests actually the people more broadly framed. And certainly the, what we talked about last time in local government is about a more expansive definition of the people in the sense of the expectation that a broader range of people, even people without rights, should have some say in the regulation of the public order. But Jefferson's vision is assuming this inequality. It makes land available. The federal government has to take it from others. So we have that inequality with Native Americans, one. But his vision of independent households also means that some people would always be dependents. And that is also crucial for supporting independence. So his vision of independence is actually building inequality into this legal order in the system in really profound, powerful ways. Two, the availability of Western land actually promotes the kind of development that Jefferson really didn't want. So those who are interested in manufacturers and commerce very quickly turned the availability of public land to their advantage. There are the speculators. They're out there buying up lands. They also see new markets. And they would love transportation to bring these goods from these new markets back to the East Coast and bring goods from the East Coast to these new markets. So in fact, huge tracts of land are ultimately given over not just to land speculators who resell the land, but also corporations who are interested in improving the land in some way. Railroads ultimately acquire huge, massive tracts of land, chief beneficiaries of this policy. Um, And they're given land free with the intent that they will build railroads, right? And then actually that will benefit the public interest. So the public interest here, you begin to hear the shift, right? From the little small farmers to, oh, the public interest is actually benefited by building railroads, handing over the public land to private corporations because they will ultimately produce economic development that will be in the public interest. So in this Jeffersonian land vision, you also have 
ooh, a shift here, ultimately from small farmers to increasingly a manufacturing vision that is actually more in line with Hamiltonian lines. And then finally, westward expansion ultimately accentuates conflict, conflicts particularly over slavery. So those issues about, oh, Northwest Territory, no slavery, Southern slaveholding leaders in those states are scratching their head going, I don't know, that's a good idea. Um, Ultimately, adding on more and more territory raises that question about slavery and its position within the United States, with some people seeing slavery as being actually opposed to the grounding interests of the republic and other people seeing it as being central. So westward expansion only heightens those differences there and then actually puts, embeds that conflict in and and weakens the republic as much as it actually strengthens it as Jefferson really wanted to do. So within Jefferson's visions is also the seeds of further change and in some ways the seeds of it own demise there. So I will leave you there. Next time we will talk more about private property and particularly how you turn what was once seen as a public right into private property um, and the limits on private property. So I will see you all next time, Wednesday. Join us every Saturday evening at 8 p.m. and midnight Eastern as we join students in college classrooms to hear lectures on topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. Lectures in History are also available as podcasts. Visit our website, cspan.org slash history slash podcasts or download